uh, in the options. No, because I made a host. I said animator, but it made a host and I lost. Ah, yes. Great. It's working. It's recording. It's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so I think if we are all ready, we can we can start as it's time. Um, I think the sound is good. Oh, we will we just wait for Gail to be back. Yeah. Oh, you are there. Okay, sorry. I, I was used to having you on my right. <laughs> okay, so thank you all. We have, um, I can show you the room actually because I'm not presenting today. So we have a few persons here. I think uh, a few of us are will come soon because we had our in total, a little bit in top 10 people yeah. registered on site and a few others online. Okay. Um, and that's it. So uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm glad that you came. We have the pleasure to welcome Ellen Benvenis today for a talk on climate-induced migrations. Uh, she is doing a post postdoctoral research at Harvard University. Um, she will talk uh, today uh, um, on climate-induced migrations. And then the floor is yours. I don't exactly know what you are going to talk about, so I'm letting you <laughs> continuing now. Thank you very much for coming. Sure, and sorry to not make it in person. Uh, well, thanks for, for the invitation. Um, so I thought would be of interest today for me would be to kind of give an overview of the topic, of what we know about it, what we don't know, and how we know things and also to what extent kind of the state of knowledge is aligned or not quite so aligned with um, kind of the dominant framing of this conversation that happens in the general public and uh, in the international policy landscape, which is climate. So I'm sure you're all aware that climate change now, we can see its impact kind of all around the globe. And in particular, those types of impacts are often what is used to try and raise awareness on climate change. And so for instance, in the US here, um, the types of phenomena that are often used are either hurricanes on the East Coast with Ian being the latest example, or floods in the Midwest or wildfires in Western states. Uh, but both here and in other kind of around the world, but particularly in Western countries, there's another type of phenomenon that has often been used really as a way to raise awareness on climate change although it's really less directly attributable to it. And that's, of course, uh, human migration. And here I'm just showing a selection of newspaper articles that have come out uh, in the past few years on this question. And what you can see is that they kind of have a, a pretty uh, specific focus on one type of migration, which is cross-border migration, and in particular, cross-border migration from global South countries towards global North countries. And really what I want to start by saying is that that's a very narrow way of seeing uh, uh, the mobility question, because this type of mobility is really just one type of outcome among many. And the reason I'm talking about mobility and not just migration is because migration and immobility really are two sides of the same coin. Both of them are not always the result of an actual desire either to move or to stay. They can be a choice or they can be more of an involuntary consequence of a given context. Now, while immobility can certainly be a choice, we also know, sorry, that resource constraints can limit the ability to migrate. And that's because migration, and particularly cross-border migration, um, is expensive, it requires resources. And so really those who move are those who are able to do so. And this is true for any type of migration. Now, the effect of climate and climate change on mobility uh, is quite complex. It can act both directly and indirectly. And depending on the context, climate stress and climate change can either induce more mobility or more immobility with various degrees of agency in the mobility outcome. And so I'm gonna to try to illustrate that with those four pictures, this quadrant here. Uh, when people think about climate-related migration, what they often have in mind is the picture on the top left. So that is displacement, uh, instances of displacement. But as you can see, it's not the only type of outcome. The picture on the top right here illustrates the fact that migration is a widely used adaptation strategy to impacts on climate change. So you might think, well, with increased climate change, uh, we might see in the future uh, a more frequent use of migration as an adaptation solution. 
And then the two pictures on the bottom here represent cases of immobility, with the picture on the bottom right illustrating an instance where people you know, are able to move, uh, are able to adapt in situ without having to move if they don't want to, for instance, by changing crop growing practices. And the picture on the bottom left is meant to represent the fact that climate stress and climate change, what it does really is that it depletes resources that are available to communities. Resources, again, which are necessary to migrate. So with increased climate change, we might also see an increase in the number of people who just cannot afford to move. Now, this, these four kind of uh, quadrant-based uh, outcomes, uh, of course, reflect on different levels of risk for the populations involved. And here, when I talk about risk, I use the, the definition that is used commonly in the IPCC framework, which is a conjunction of hazards, exposure, and vulnerability. And so if you, if you want to think about how uh, mobility outcomes can affect risk, well, if you look here at kind of a climate-driven risk, the first response that you're going to see tends to be, is going to tend to be in situ adaptation. That's often what people say first. But if that adaptation is successful, that's going to lead to a decrease in rates. So if you think about the quadrant in the picture before, that was the picture on the bottom right. Now, if the adaptation in situ is not successful, that's often when you start seeing mobility responses. responses sorry. And so those mobility outcomes can either lead to a decrease in risk in case of successful migration as adaptation strategy, or an increase in risk in case either of displacement or of resource constraint uh, leading to immobility. And so um, to me, this is a really helpful picture, kind of conceptual way of thinking about climate-related mobility. And if you want to think uh, more about this, a good place to start, of course, is the latest IPCC report. Uh, and in particular, the, the report from Working Group 2 that came out in April or March or something in the spring. Uh, there is no one devoted chapter on migration, but migration is prominently featured on those three chapters. So I encourage you all to, to check it out. So this is kind of the outline of the talk today. Um, really, the types of questions that people ask in the, on this topic tend, tends to be kind of divided into three or four types. The first one being what has been going on so far, to what extent up until now, has environmental stress or climate stress uh, affected migration patterns? Um, then the next set of questions is, of course, what is going to happen in the future, and in particular in the future with increasing climate change. And then the last two sets are really going to be about, OK, so what should we do about it, or what is being done about it? How are people thinking about this question? Um, and I'm going to start by addressing briefly this question of border policy, which seems to be featuring prominently in, in general debates uh, and its role um, as a kind of climate policy, quote unquote. And finally, um, really kind of taking a step back and talking a little bit about kind of the institutional landscape in particular at, at the global, uh, at the international scale um, that is relevant for this issue. So I can't really see you guys right now, so because I'm sharing my slides. So if you have questions or something, feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, but let's start with the with the first part of this uh, talk, which is really going to focus um, on 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 what has been going on so far. So there is a pretty big literature, of course, documented the effect of environmental stress on migration so far. Here I'm going to draw from a current work that I'm doing with colleagues at Harvard. Uh, but I'm also going to address kind of the broader claims that are that are being the broader results that are being found in the literature. And first, of course, I can't talk about climate-related migration without acknowledging what has been happening in Pakistan this year. Uh, as you're aware by now, uh, the monsoon season this this year has been particularly um, disastrous in Pakistan, with extreme rainfall leading to about a third of the country underwater and over 30 million people being displaced. So in these types of events. It's often really quite straightforward to, to relate the effect of the climate-related aspect to mobility, to migration, and in this case, to displacement. But there are many other instances where the causality question is much more uh, blurry. Another example, for instance, to think about is, for instance, what happened in Kenya in 2009, where around that time, um, there was a severe drought that was hitting the country. And so here, what I'm trying to give you an idea of, uh, you know, this kind of database analysis. On the left hand side here is a map of Kenya with in blue. It's uh, the eastern district. So it's one of the districts of Kenya. It's very rural, a lot of agriculture going on there. 
And I'm also highlighting here in green narrowly the capital city. And what I'm plotting on the right is kind of concomitant evidence of you know, a link between environmental stress and migration. So the top plot is the migration rate between this, from this district to the capital city over time. And then in red and blue green, I have the temperature measurements over the years and the measures of soil moisture, which, which gives you an indication of the level of drought in the area. And so what you can see here is that in 2009, uh, there was a much higher migration rate that was concomitant with a spike, a positive spike in temperature and a negative spike in soil moisture. And so when you read a government reports uh, about that event, what seems to come out of it is that what happened was that this drought lead to, led to significant declines in agricultural production in that area, which led a lot of people to move to the city to try and diversify their sources of income. So really the kind of questions that drive uh, this whole part of the literature is, okay, to what extent does this relationship really hold in other contexts? And that the response to that question really depends a lot on the type of study that you look at. Um, here I'm showing results from a meta-analysis that came out a couple of years ago. What that group did was that they put together all the quantified estimates that exist out there of the effect of env environmental stress on migration. I looked at studies that focus on within country migration and on those that focus on international migration. So here on these graphs, each one of those box plots here is for a given study that they looked at. And what you want to look at basically is to what extent the median of each box plot is to the left of the big solid bar here and here, or is it to the right of the solid bar? If it's to the right, it means that environmental stress increased migration. If it's to the left, it means that environmental stress decreased that migration. And so what you see really is the main thing I want you to take away from this is really that you see a whole lot of variation in how migration is used as a response to environmental stress. And so the main question that this part of the literature tries to answer is why do we find those types of very different effects across contexts? And because I mentioned in the introduction that theoretically you can kind of find a, a story there is a storytelling that match whichever result you're going to find. It becomes very difficult to figure out which results are robust versus which are not, because whichever result you're going to find, you're going to kind of be able to tell a story for why this is happening. So this is still ongoing in the literature, and this is what this project is trying to contribute to. What we focus on here particularly, um, the way we go about it, sorry, is that we do um, an empirical study that is retrospective, of course, and what we use is causal inference, that is a bunch of regression models to try and identify the effects of environmental stress on migration. So that's the type of approach that is very commonly used in this literature, but to try and make sure that we are finding robust effects and we're not just overfitting the data, that is making, making the data say more than it's actually saying, we're gonna do a, a series of out of sample testing exercises as well. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into the methods, but it's just to give people a, kind of an idea of the type of ways people go about uh, looking at this question. Particularly here, we focus on this agricultural channel, so this kind of Kenya case where people uh, make their migration decisions based on kind of their subsistence agricultural um, income source. And so we're going to look at effects of temperature and soil moisture, particularly in the crop growing seasons in those areas in crop areas at origin locations. And we're gonna look at those effects on migration rates, both within borders and across borders, uh, across a whole bunch of countries. I'm gonna show you how many. And then we're gonna test for heterogeneity in the migration responses, both across climate zones, but also across demographics of migrants. And so why do we do this? Well, again, it's trying to better understand just not just when and where, but also how and for whom migration is affected by climate stress. And so to give you a sense of the type of data that we use here, I'm plotting uh, things that come out of the migration data set basically, which we, for which we use a census data that is harmonized across many countries. So the left panels are for within country migration and the right panel are for uh, cross-border migration. And so the maps show a kind of average out migration rates of, over the observation period, which is kind of between 1990 and 2010. And then the two, bottom graphs here show the disaggregation of migrants per education, age, and sex. And what you can see here is that the type of people who migrate within countries versus across countries is quite a bit different in terms of education and age, for instance. 
And so there is good reason to think that maybe the response to climate shocks is also going to be different. The other type of data we use, of course, is that we're going to need climate and agricultural data. So for that, we're going to heavily rely on weather station and satellite data. On the top here, I'm plotting uh, temperature and soil moisture measurements. And on the bottom plots, uh, I'm plotting um, indicators that are used to test for degrees of heterogeneity. So we use a heterogeneity across climate zones with a focus on the tropical, dry, hot, and temperate zones, which are the areas where this uh, effect of climate stress on agriculture is expected to be the highest. And then finally, on um, different indicators to test the degree of dependence for agriculture, and in particular here, irrigation. Uh, I'm hearing the beep of the chat, but I can't see the chat when I'm sharing my slides. So if there are urgent questions, Loic, feel free to interrupt me at some point. Um, so just to share quickly the types of findings that we get here, here, this plot, let me walk you through this. Um, I'm showing response curves of migration rates uh, with respect to temperature variability in top here in red and soil moisture variability in blue green here. And each result is shown for the three different climate zones, so tropical, dry, hot, and temperate. What you can see here is there's quite a, a bit of heterogeneity in the migration response, depending on where you look at, which, which climate zone you look at. But the kind of more robust finding that we seem to find here is that people tend to move more, in particular during droughts, uh, in dry, hot, and temperate areas. So kind of within country, oh, here, yeah, sorry. Here, it's really about within country migration that I'm sharing results here. Within country migration increases when and where it is dry. So this kind of gets to the you know when and where question, but it doesn't get as much to the whom question. So who gets to move? And who doesn't? And so here I'm showing the same results, but this time disaggregated by education levels. Uh, that is, we allow the response to environmental stress to differ across education levels here in particular. And so the color code here, the darker shades are for uh, the lower educated and the lighter share for the higher shade, lighter shared shades, sorry, for the higher educated. And so what you see here, and this is the kind of things that kind of highlight the degree of heterogeneity that you see in migration responses is that the groups that are most sensitive to climate stress are going to differ across time zones. In particular, in the tropical and dry hot areas, you tend to see the people who are reacting most, moving most under climate stress to be the most educated in the sense that it seems to be concomitant with the story that only the ones who have enough resources to move are able to do so. Whereas in the temperate zone, you see the opposite. You see the less educated moving out more under climate stress. And that seems to be more concomitant with a story of you know, just the people with less resourcing being pushed out with climate stress. So this seems to be playing out again um, different types of, of stories, different types of storylines, depending on where you look at and who you're talking about. Now, this was mainly for within country migration. If you do the same exercise for cross-border migration, uh, I'm showing results here again, disaggregated by education levels. Um, we find kind of a similar heterogeneity across education levels here uh, in terms of cross border migration response. But the two main differences with within country migration that we find are first, the fact that the effect seems to be really less driven by agriculture. I don't have too much time to get into why that's the case. But the main other point is that it seems to be that we only find a robust effect of climate stress on cross-border migration once we start disaggregating that response per education level. If we don't do that, we find no robust effect at all, which um, what I mean by robust is that when you try to do uh, out-of-sample testing to see if that model is robust, um, all the skill of the model kind of collapses. And we've reproduced other studies that are the ones that, um, the few others that we found where we could actually uh, do that exercise because they made the code and data available and the ones that don't have a disaggregation by education level, we also find a collapse of skills. So that's something that to keep in mind here, the degree of robustness of findings that we're able to find. So kind of um, summary for, for this section of the talk, uh, kind of the highlights that we have is first, that within country migration tends to increase in the drought and that the agricultural explanation seems to be viable for this type of migration, but not so much for cross-border migration. What seems to stand for both sides is that the different gr the groups that are going to move more or less are going to depend 
on the climate zone, and in particular, education <clears throat> seems to be very important in explaining uh, migration patterns here. Um, so that was kind of to give you an example of the type of uh, the type of things that people do to try and figure out so far how environmental stress has has affected migration. And then, but now, and then, of course, the, yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any any sense about um, when people is is migrating out of its country, where he or she goes? Do you have some statistics on this? Do you yeah. So far away. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So uh, I should preface this by saying the type of migration data that people can uh, that you are able to get uh, really varies a lot in quality. And for people who are more used to uh, working with natural sciences data, that can be quite uh, striking because um, the data quality on migration tends to be much much less good and much much less disaggregated than um, data that you can get on climate variables, for instance. Uh, that being said. Uh, the data we use here has information on destination. Uh, we haven't done, so the way we look at here is that we test for the effect of climate stress specifically for a given migration corridor. So we're gonna look specifically at the effect of the origin destination pair, uh, which is gonna be very important because obviously um, people who move from uh, one sub-Saharan African country to its neighbor, are going to be very different from people who move from that same country to a European country, for instance. And so we're able to control for that. That's not necessarily the case, depending on the type of migration data you work with. Uh, often you just get in and out migration flows, and that's it. Uh, here we're able to have what, what we call bilateral flows. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll start, uh, I'll start moving ahead, but feel free to interrupt again with more questions. So kind of moving forward, I'm going to change gears a little bit because it's going to be a pretty different types of methodology, but we're going to, a lot of the questions that are of interest to people is also to try and figure out to what extent migration patterns are going to change in the future when there is more climate change. And in particular, um, are they going to, who, for whom are they going to change really? And so for that part, I'm going to draw on a paper that uh, co-authors and I published recently earlier this year. Um, and what we do really in those types of exercises, whether for this paper or in general, uh, people who try to do some kind of projection exercises of migration is that, is that we're gonna do modeling exercises that are gonna allow, uh, allow us to project migration patterns uh, over the century, over a few decades, et cetera. Uh, I'm saying projecting and not predicting, it's an important distinction. Um, the types of models that can be used for those exercises uh, are quite varied. Here, the type of model that we've been using for this paper and for uh, kind of the broader research agenda that I've been developing are integrated assessment models, which are basically a simple climate model that is coupled to a model of the world economy. I'm sure many of you in the room know what that is. Um, those IMs have several limitations, in particular spatially. Often of the existing ones don't have a very high level of spatial disaggregation, so in particular, you're not really able to model international uh, within country migration so far. So this part of the talk is really gonna focus on cross-border migration. Uh, another thing I want to say about those types of models, the IAMs, is that uh, typically they don't include migration explicitly because they're not really used for migration as a primary purpose. So we have to modify them a bit so that we can use them for that goal. And so the way we went about this, uh, in this project was that we first developed kind of on the side a model of cross-border migration and remittances flows. In particular, we did that at the income quintile level in order to capture, uh, you know, how an individual with more or less resources available is going to be more or less constrained in their migration decision. And then the main thing we're going to do is that we're going to include this migration model as well as income distributions in an existing IAM. So in an existing climate economy model, economy model and then we're going to be able to do runs, that is run the model uh, ahead, you know, forward, and do runs with climate change and without climate change. And that's going to be the difference between those two runs that's going to allow us to quantify the effect of climate change on various indicators of interest, in particular on the migrants' income profiles, on the damages from climate change as a shock on the income, particularly of poor populations, and finally on the mobility patterns and immobility patterns. Again, why do we do this? Well, it's really a way to allow us to understand better the interactions between the climate and the economy, 
and migration patterns in a way that is kind of more general equilibrium than just strictly reduced form, which was the type of approach that I presented previously. So the first step I mentioned was kind of to develop a model of migration kind of aside from the IAM. And here we modeled cross-border migration, international mi migration. And let me note here that we model all international migration, not just the one that is climate related. Now, major drivers of international long-term migration can be classified in three sets. First, you have economic opportunities. People move to other places in order to earn higher wages or to be able to send money back home to their home communities. Then when modeling migration, we want to take into account the fact that the proximity between origin and destination, whether geographic or cultural, is going to matter for migration. And finally, the migration costs. And here we're really going to focus on the resources that are necessary to migrate. We use what is called a gravity framework. Uh, this idea of gravity is simply this idea of running all of those push and pull factors together in one quantitative framework. Now, the specificity of the gravity framework that we use here is that we design it at the income quintile level. And again, it's to get at this question of who moves and who doesn't, and in particular, at the question of to what extent the amount of resources you have is going to drive your migration decision. And so in this model, we're going to model bilateral migration flows. So to get to the question that were asked before, again, here we have information on the origin destination pair. Um, the first step of the model is going to be to account the number of people who move from a given origin O and come from a specific income quintile Q to go to a given destination B. So that's really the big gravity equation that's going to be a function of population sizes. Then in dark blue here, you have the econ economic opportunity variable. So first, the ratio of per capita income between destination and origin. So that illustrates the pool to move towards richer countries. Then we have uh, remittances indicators that kind of hint at the existing networks. Um, in green, importantly, we have the uh, resource constraint that needs to be overcome in order to migrate. And here we use the income per capita in the quintile of origin. And finally, in blue green, we have the proximity measures. And here we use uh, the distance between origin and destination and whether they have a common official measure. And then quite simply, we're going to do a distribution of that number of people onto the income quintile or at destination. That's going to be a function of this income ratio of per capita income between the uh, destination and origin, which illustrates the relative level of development of the two locations. So what we do with this migration model is that we estimate it uh, using regression models or this regression um, using past data, in particular coming from the World Bank. And then we're going to use it for the projection exercise. And so there, that's where the other model comes in, which is the integrated assessment model. That's going to allow us to do the projection exercise in a world with climate change. And that's important because what we want here is to look at the effects of climate change on migration patterns, and in particular on resource deprivation. And that, what it is, is really damages from climate change, which are monetized impacts from climate change. And that's where IEMs come in, because that, those are the types of models that are often used to compute uh, those types of damage. So this is a very stylized representation of an IM. The idea is that it, com it combines a simple climate model to model of the global economy. You have economic activity that generates greenhouse gas emissions, which increase the global mean temperature. That increase generates impacts which are, which are monetized in the form of damages, which then come back to affect the economy. And again, I mentioned migration is typically not included explicitly in those models. So what we did here was that we coupled are um, included migration and income distributions in the IAM. We used one that is called fund. And the way we did that really was that we coupled the migration model per income quintile that I just described to an existing model, an existing IAM. And to do that, we took as input to the migration model, the population sizes and income levels of each location of the model over time. And then we sent back for each time step the number of people moving between locations, as well as the remittances and expenses. So this kind of modeling framework allows us to do those types of projection exercises. So let me show you just a few results. Uh, one of the results we can get out of this is the income profiles of migrants over time. Here I'm just showing results for the South American region for a medium scenario of future development and climate change. On the left panel, I'm showing the number of people who are leaving the region over time. And on the right panel, the number of people who are entering the region. And the time scale is kind of the century. 
Uh, and the color code illustrates the income quintile with yellow meaning the richest quintile up to dark blue, which is the poorest. So what you see on the left here is that people who leave South America tend to come from the higher income level, in higher part of the income distribution. And that tends to be true, by the way, for all regions and scenarios that we look at. And then the people who enter the region also here tend to end up rather at the higher end of the income distribution. But here that really depends on the region. So typically people who arrive in lower income regions are going to end up at the higher end of the income distribution often, whereas people who arrive on the in kind of higher income regions are going to end up in the lower end of the income distribution. So this is kind of a pretty straightforward result, but it's just to give you a sense of the type of um, findings that we can get out of those models. The next thing I want to show is to what extent climate change damages represent really shock, shocks on income available for people, and in particular for the poorest populations. So here I'm showing results for the year 2100 for the poorest income quintile in each location. And the panel on the left is for a world that is a medium scenario, and the panel on the right for a pessimistic scenario, so a world with more climate change and more inequality. And what I'm showing here on the maps is the damages of climate change as a share of income in each region. And so what you see on the left here is that um, climate change damages represent up to 20% of the income of the poorest populations in the medium scenario, and on the right, up to 48% in the pessimistic scenario. To com give a, a comparison with the highest income quintile in each region, uh, damages from climate change never go above 2 to 3% of their income there. So what this means is that damages from climate change represent a substantial shock on available resources, particularly for the poorest populations. And that, of course, is going to translate to the mobility outcomes. And here I'm going to show the effect of climate change, particularly on the number of people who are leaving the poorest income quintile in each region. Again, that's where the year 2100, the left panel, the medium scenario, the right panel, the pessimistic scenario. And here the pink shades are going to illustrate a decrease in the number of people leaving with climate change versus without climate change, while the green shades show the opposite. So what we find here is that climate change leads to a decrease of our migration of the poorest populations in Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and the former Soviet Union, by up to 10% in the medium scenario, and by up to 16% in the pessimistic scenario. Now, of course, those results are highly dependent on how damages on climate change are specified in the model. So in order to stress test those findings, we also test for a version where we have what we call catastrophic damages of climate change. That is, the same amount of climate change is just going to have much harsher effects on the economy than with this baseline specification, which is probably a bit too optimistic. When we do that, when we add catastrophic damages, this is what we find. We find that climate change starts really decreasing out-migration of the poorest populations in almost every region, and by up to 20% uh, in the pessimistic scenario for the North African region. This, by the way, let me note, is not self-evident. Of course, in the catastrophic case, you know, you're going to have more damages, so that's going to reduce resources available to migrate, but it's also going to increase the pool to move towards richer locations because poor regions are more affected by damages. So what this result really suggests is that the resource constraint here really seems to dominate the pool to move towards richer locations. And so the again, to us, the takeaway for this was that resource constraint immobility at the very least is not at all going to be a rare circumstance and rather we expect it to play a substantial role in this climate migration axis. What this means is that the populations are gonna be unable to leave as a result of resource deprivation caused by climate change will be left extremely vulnerable, both to subsequent impacts on climate change and more generally to risk derived from equal poverty. And so the policies that omit those types of outcomes might actually substantially underestimate the detrimental impacts of climate change on vulnerable populations. So that was kind of a brief summary of this project. Again, if there are some questions, I'm happy to take them now or later. Um, I can go ahead otherwise. Yeah, I have a question, Helen. Yeah. Because in the first part, you told us that um, education is a key driver of migration. And here, you did not put this into account. Yeah, so the way we take this into account kind of indirectly is by looking at income quintile, uh, which is kind of, we have to assume it's kind of a proxy. It's kind of strongly correlated with education levels, which is not entirely true. Uh, but that was the way we were able to implement this in this model. But I agree that uh, education is probably uh, 
he probably deserves to be represented as is and, and not as a proxy such as uh, income tax. Okay, thank you. So where I want to take this next is really as, you know, what have people been doing about this and what have people been talking about in terms of solution? And here I'll, I'll, draw, I'll, I'll draw on a, another paper with the same co-authors that came out a couple of years ago, where really we took this very similar modeling approach, but asked a very different question, which was what about the rule of border policy? And why we asked that question was that when you think back to the introduction that I gave, all those newspaper articles, this question of you know, how people are dealing with the borders seems to be on everyone's mind when we talk about climate-related migration. So, so what does it do in practice? Um, the way we model that, if you look back at this gravity framework that I mentioned in the previous section, was that instead of focusing on, on the, the resources that are necessary to migrate, we're really gonna insist on migration costs in terms of border policy. So what we do is that we stylize uh, we, we model very stylized versions of border policies that are more or less restrictive, and, and we try and see the effects on the various indicators that the, this model can give us. So what do we find here? Well, the first thing we find is that border policy doesn't seem to work at all in terms of climate mitigation policy, uh, which might not be super surprising, but it's worth being said. Here I'm plotting on the left-hand side the world CO2 emissions uh, over the century, and on the right-hand side the increase in global mean temperature, uh, the color codes are for the different scenarios, so more or less climate change and different patterns of development. And then the different shapes here are for border policy. So again, more or less open. What you see here is that border policy seems to have a pretty moderate effect uh, on emissions and definitely on lower, lower pathways and has virtually no effect on temperature. So patterns of uh, emissions and development have a much, much, much stronger effect on, on increasing temperature than border policy, which is not very surprising, but it's still something uh, being worth saying. However, uh, if you look at border policy in terms of its effects on climate change adaptation and not in any more on climate change mitigation, uh, you're going to find a strong effect and not necessarily in the right quote unquote direction. Here, what I'm plotting, what we're interested in, sorry, was to look at the effect of climate change in particular on exposure and vulnerability of people uh, to climate change impacts. And so in particular, we were looking, uh, sorry, looking at the effect of border policy on this quantity, on, on the effect, on the ratio of damages from climate change over income in each location. And here, what I'm plotting is, okay, when people move, do they move to an area where that, that ratio is gonna increase, where they're gonna increase their exposure and vulnerability, or do they move to an area where they're gonna decrease it? I'm plotting back here for different colors, which are different border policies, with the yellow meaning closed borders, and then the blue and green meaning different degrees of openness. What we find here in particular is that migrants, in particular from developing countries, if you look at the results for North Africa and Southeast Asia, when they are allowed to move, they often tend to move to less exposed areas than where they came from. And this reduction in exposure and vulnerability uh, can be quite substantial. So up to four percentage points of GDP, which is really substantial. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that when you start implementing restrictive border policy, what that ends up doing is that it seems to increase levels of exposure and vulnerability by keeping people in areas where they find themselves more exposed and vulnerable than where they would otherwise migrate if they had the opportunity to do so. And so our takeaway from that project was really that migration policy should also be a part of climate policy discussion just because migration policies actually have pretty strong consequences on people's ability to adapt to climate change. And so that's something that is not a whole lot talked about uh, in, in the climate policy discussions. And, and that was something to us that, that was important to raise. And I'm gonna move ahead to, to the last section of the talk, which is kind of a broader overview of what really uh, international institutions uh, and, and international policy, uh, the, way, the way people are thinking about this issue and what has been done so far. And I wanna start by kind of taking stock about the type of institutions that are relevant for this issue of climate-related mobility. Uh, here I'm showing five different uh, institutions here. Um, on the left, you start with the UN uh, Refugee Agency, then you have the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, then the Global Compact for Migration, which is a non-binding agreement that was signed in late 2018 
that aims to provide this kind of holistic approach to all types of cross-border migration, regardless of the, co uh, of the cause, sorry. Then the sustainable development goals, uh, those 17 goals for 2030, uh, where a couple of the 17 goals are directly related to migration and climate change. And finally, of course, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is particularly timely this week as discussions are wrapping up in Egypt. Um, what's worth noting is that at this point, um, all those institutions de deal with this issue of climate-related mobility, but they deal with it in a rather narrow fashion in the sense that they are largely focused on cross-border movement and exclusively focused on movement and not at all on mobility. And what we've seen here earlier in this talk is that both when you look in the past and in the future is that this is probably a really too narrow way of thinking about climate related mobility. And so you might want to think about, about kind of alternative approaches. So some of the normative approaches that could inform uh, changes in, institu in, in institutional structure, for instance, um, some normative approaches have been proposed so far. So this kind of whole debate around whether it would be a good idea to create the statutes around climate refugees. Um, one of the issues with the refugee status, so there is a very big literature uh, debating whether that's or not a good idea and kind of arguing that it's probably not a super good idea. One of the things that um, might be problematic here is that refugees, of course, uh, only focus on cross-border uh, movement. Um, the second approach that has been considered is this humanitarian set of approaches, which is really discussed a lot this week in China Czech. Um, and this uh, set of approaches really relies on kind of ad hoc decisions and kind of on the goodwill uh, of donor countries. Um, so it doesn't seem to kind of address the issue systematically. And the final point, uh, the final approach that is being used, and that gets back to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, is this notion of loss and damage, because the only way the UN Framework Convention at this point addresses the question of climate-related mobility is since 2015, since the Paris Agreement, it's since this form of loss and damage. That's the only part of the conversation where the mobility question is addressed. Uh, our view here is that that's probably too restrictive a concept, because just like the other approaches, loss and damage is largely focused on displacement and it's largely focused in particular on reactive action that is you need to wait until the movement has taken place to make a claim that policy action is necessary which is what we see empirically is not necessarily um the most uh, it does not cover a wide enough range um of of mobility outcomes and so i'm really looking forward to see what's going to come out of this Year's talks in Egypt in particular, because you're all aware probably that the loss and damage conversation uh, has been a very big part of this. Uh, I want to mention though that the mobility question as part of loss and damage has occupied a pretty minor place in official negotiation. There has been a lot of side events on the topic, but as far as I can tell, and I was trying to read the draft just before this that came out, um, the mobility question is not really addressed so far. So I think, um, in our sense, theoretically, the loss and damage framework is probably a bit too narrow to treat, uh, to deal with this climate mobility question. But again, because loss and damage is still largely being defined as we speak, um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the next few months will bring in terms of, of development on this point. And with that, uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have questions online? Uh, we have the, the habit of giving uh, the power to people who are online. So if somebody online has questions, you can raise your hands or directly speak. Otherwise, I will give the floor for questions here. I think we will we may have some. I have some. So, but um, does someone want to want to start? I think online for now we have nobody who wants to talk. Um, I can. Paul. Um, so, um, speak loud. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me like, like this? Okay. So, uh, so first, thank you. Truly, uh, it's quite fantastic and opening a lot of things. Uh, I was very curious about two things in uh, the modeling side of your work when you coupled a fund model with those migration 
the first one was about so you have taken as migration uh, drivers the economic opportunity uh, migration costs i'm not sure i understand exactly how uh, having both a migration mode and a proximity taking into account, like how isn't both phenomena taking into account the same thing? Uh, so, um, so I was curious about that. About how did you calibrate uh, the behavior of the agents? And uh, one topic uh, I was discussing with Loic, in which I'm looking for more data is on the uh, regional disaggregation of damage function and on social classes disaggregation of damage function. Because from what I understand, uh, damage functions are much bigger on a low income people than on high income. Is it something uh, you think, uh, is, is it taken into account here? And how can we take it uh, into account in general? Yeah, thank you, great question. Um, I'm going to take them in order. The first one on migration costs versus proximity, you write that um, conceptually, I think they're quite different, but empirically, if you want to estimate them, you end up estimating kind of the, the way migration cost really is included in the, in the estimation is that it's often estimated implicitly. That is, we control for a bunch of things and we control explicitly for the distance and the cultural proximity. And the coefficients that are given us are kind of baking in kind of implicit migration costs, which we have to assume are going to stay constant over the projection time, uh, which is obviously um, a, a limiting assumption, but that's not something that uh, we tweaked around too much. Uh, on the calibration of the behavior of agents, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Uh, I'll just say that uh, this gravity thing is um, not just a big equation that comes from the Top down, it, it's really micro founded. If you were to model the behavior of an agent uh, that would try to choose between different locations as a way of kind of maximizing preferences, and then you would aggregate all those preferences, you would end up with a very similar gra gravity function. So I'm using it here in a kind of very top down perspective, but it is micro founded and it's supposed to, to kind of calibrate the behavior of agents. Now, of course, there is a lot of type types of responses that we're not taking into account because we have to make simplifications. In particular, you know, to what extent people get access to information about different things. Uh, that's, again, very implicit in the model um, because that's not the angle that we wanted to study too much. But um, yeah, so the implicit estimation does a lot of heavy lifting. And the last point on the damages uh, disaggregation as a function of social class. So that's exactly what we do. I didn't get into too many details because I wasn't sure how many uh, technical details the crowd wanted. But basically, you have to make, you have to figure out how damages from climate change are going to be distributed onto the different income quintiles of the state. The way you do that, um, so we looked a lot at the empirical literature to try that tries and documents the effect of climate change on inequality. Uh, in our sense, uh, at, the, at the time we did the research, which at this point uh, is a couple years ago already, two, three years ago, uh, the literature did not allow us to calibrate the, the elasticity well at all. So the way we did that was that we took three values that to us uh, kind of did the range of outcomes. So the higher end was that uh, damages are proportional to income, so everybody is affected the same proportionally, which is very optimistic. Then there was a median option, which was that damages are independent of income, so everybody is hit with the same amount of money, but that's going to represent a much larger share for both of patients. And then we're going to have the more extreme version where damages are inversely proportional to income. And so we did result for all three. The results I showed today are for the medium assumption. Um, if you do the results of, for the more pessimistic assumption, you get a, a much stronger effect on immobility, resource constraint immobility for the for the poorest populations. Um, but yeah, because again, the, the, in my view, the empirical literature is still not really able to give us a good, a good idea of this elasticity. Uh, that, that's how we did this episode. Thank you. Does someone have a, a question before I start? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation. I, I have a question on the um, um, economic opportunity part. Um, my question is essentially, did, did you use any sort of historical data to calibrate the um, 
economic opportunities and i'm thinking especially um potential historical data on the you know uh economic mobility of immigrants into the country of immigration and um in your model in general in the simulations that you've run do you see cultural proximity as taking the lead uh, from economic opportunities or like is there an aspect that is more predictive of how many and where immigrants uh, choose to migrate yeah so that there is a huge digital migration on that that i'm just uh, here we're just marginally contributing to but uh let me answer in two ways first uh the cultural proximity the way we model it is constant over time so we're just going to assume that because the cultural proximity, the only way we model it here is through the distribution of common official languages. And we just assume that that stays constant over time. That's a simplification, obviously. On the economic uh, uh, opportunity aspect, and in particular on how people maybe move up the income ladder, I don't know if that's the things you kind of right. had in mind at destination. So the way, so my sense of the literature, and again, I'm not full on in there, is that, um, there seems to be kind of a debate as to to what extent uh, people climb up the income ladder once they are at destination. My reading on the literature is that people don't climb up upon arrival, it's their children that are gonna do the heavy lifting of their upward mobility. So the way we model that here is that, um, I wanna mention that when we model the migration for income quintile, uh, you can change income quintile between origin and destination. It's not because you're in one income quintile at origin that you're going to be in the same at destination. However, what we model is that once you've arrived there, you cannot stay there for the duration of your life. Now, your children might do differently, but you're going to stay in the same income quintile. So it's a simplifying assumption again. Just, yeah. just a quick follow-up question on, on, on what you said. So if if you if migrants have some sort of expectation of the economic outcomes that they have once they migrate, do you, I, I guess it's more of an empirical question, do, do you know if in the data um, some kind of um, objective, uh, I guess, expectation of economic outcome is very predictive for the, con for the choice of country of immigration? Yeah, so the way we came out of this is that that's why we modeled the migration flows in two steps. What we kind of assume, kind of based on our reading of the data, is that people don't necessarily have a very good sense of where they're going to land at destination on the income distribution. So what they're going to take as information is kind of the mean outcome there. And then afterwards, there is stuff that's, you know, that's why then afterwards you have the distribution onto the income quintile at destination, because it's kind of trying to model the course assumption that people have rather limited information as to how well they're going to fare at destination, which is actually relatively relatively accurate. When you uh, read a lot about you know, all those debates about to what extent migrants uh, are aware or not of the social services or the social safety nets that are, they're going to be able to benefit from, uh, most people have very little information on those types of questions, for instance. So, um, that was kind of our way to, to model that. So, that's okay. Do I have questions? I have some questions. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I will take back my uh, journalist hats for some questions because, uh, so I have a master's degree in climate change journalism and I follow closely these big headlines about climate migration, in the, especially in the Western medias. Um, so, I have one question uh, on. What would you advise to climate journalists in order to do a better coverage of the topic of climate migrations? And my second question is, I've seen recently others articles from researchers questioning the, the idea of simply climate refugees or climate migrants, uh, saying that it actually doesn't really exist because it's mainly socioeconomical causes behind the migration. And I would also like to have your opinion on, on this debate, if you have one. <laughs> yeah, uh, the journalism question, um, for sure. Um, I think a trend that I'm seeing recently and that's encouraging is that it seems that 
a lot of the journalism is not just done anymore. Even if it's in Western countries, it's not just done anymore strictly from the perspective of the destination area. But you see a lot more on the ground reporting in origin communities about what that looks, about what the reality looks like there and about how people end up making different decisions. And in particular, what is the situation also for the people who end up not moving, uh, you know, the members of the households that might stay behind and what, what is the reality for them there. And I think that's an important part of the conversation because it's not just about the media. I think the way the Western media has often portrayed this um, is quite aligned with the way the issue is being dealt with by the international institutions at this point. And um, which in particular on the climate regime side is quite driven by the perspective of destination countries, I think so far. Um, and so I think pushing more towards, uh, you know, kind of highlighting perspectives that are not strictly about destination areas, I think is really, really uh, important. On the second point, which is, um, which was that, oh yeah, the, the refugees that, well, refugees is a whole other thing be, between the refugee status really is a legal status. And so uh, the, the climate question, it, it's different directly tied to this notion of persecution, of whether you're able to demonstrate persecution of individuals. And uh, as soon as you get into that, the, the, the climate effect becomes very, very iffy. I think the pushback that comes uh, on the more broadly climate migrant thing is that, um, I mean, that's true for kind of the, the broader migration debate is there, there seems to be a pattern in particular in destination areas to differentiate migrants based on their reason to migrate, which is uh, a bit strange when you think about what's actually happening on the ground, you know, economic migrants being treated differently from refugees, et cetera, et cetera, where it, it's not, it's never clear cut the causality is always a mush of things. And some people might be considered economic migrants, whereas uh, the persecution might just be more difficult to prove, but it was there anyways. So uh, this whole, I, I think the reason people are pushing back is because the whole notion of causality of migration, while important for many ways, kind of underlies a little bit of tone of there are deserving migrants and there are undeserving migrants. And that's a narrative against which I think a lot of people are pushing. Uh, on the climate specifically, um, one of the ways we see is that a lot of the effects appear to be really indirect and strongly mediated by a whole lot of other factors, economic, social, but also, um, you know, institutional, political, to what extent the, you know, the institutions at the local level, at the national <coughs> level are resilient, are, you know, subject to corruption or whatnot, that's going to determine a lot uh, about what people are able to take in terms of decisions of wh whether they decide to move, where they decide to go, et cetera. So, um, yeah, both an empirical question, which is, Climate is one of many reasons why people move. And the kind of normative aspect, which is pushing back against a, a different a merit, meritocratic scale of, of migration. If that makes sense. Mm. Thanks. Uh, I just saw this week that in the glossary of the IPCC working group number two reports, they removed the climate migrations definitions. It was, it's not there anymore. It was there in the previous assessment report. And I was thinking, yeah, that's that's a sign. Um, I, I think the term, that's why I've been using mobility. That's really the term that seems to be uh, taking up in the, in the literature anyways, um, in the academic literature, because of this focus on, we, there is no reason to strictly focus on those who move versus those who don't uh, from a policy perspective. What's most policy relevant is not necessarily the ones who move, uh, they're just more politically visible, which is a different question. And so it's important to take into account kind of the whole range of mobility outcomes, which is what I've been saying 15 times over this talk. Okay. Yeah, do we have uh, yeah, last questions? questions. <laughs> Sorry, very quickly, because we are running out of time. Um, <clears throat> the first one is, can you give us a sense of the impact of the uh, damage function that you use in terms of temperature versus loss of, let's say, world real GDP? And you have two damage functions, one which is moderate, the other one which is more pessimistic. So how much would we lose, let's say at the world level with plus four degrees or plus six degrees, I don't know. This is my first question. And the second one is, if I correctly understood the way you coupled the IM with uh, 
uh, you know, the, the economy model with the climate model. Um, how do you do to reproduce, let's say, an SSP scenario? How do you know that the damage function will not prevent an economy from emitting enough CO2 in order to still follow one IPCC scenario? Yeah, thank you. So very briefly, the first question, um, I'm ashamed to realize that I don't have the numbers off the top of my head for the medium scenario. I know that for the catastrophic one, if I'm not mistaken, we were using just adding a specification that comes from one of the Weizmann papers, which adds like, I mean, I think it's a diminution of GDP by 50% globally uh, for an increase in temperature, global mean temperature of six degrees. I think yeah. that's what he uses and that's what we used for the catastrophic damages side. I am realized that I forgot the numbers for the kind of baseline one, but I, I can get to, back to you on that. On the, on the scenarios one, um, so here it is. Uh, the scenario aspect is always a very difficult the, the way the scenario world is set up is that uh, using them in a consistent way uh, is quite difficult because uh, it's not always clear how, you know, for what purpose they've been designed. My sense of for why the SSP RCP framework has been designed is that, I mean, that's not my sense, that's what the community says is that it's been designed to do impact studies. And so it's been purposefully designed to not have climate change impacts baked in them exactly so that we could use them as input into that kind of model to then study impacts. And so those different scenarios, uh, the input scenarios that are used in the model, you're right, do not have the effect of climate change on them, but that's why the IAM is helpful is because it's gonna get back the effect uh, of climate change on those different dimensions. So. Strictly, uh, technically speaking, uh, what the IEM does is that it's going to affect the level, of course, the growth rates of everything are driven by the input scenarios. That's really what's going to happen there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are right on time, or maybe yes, my two minutes perfect. Um, thank you very much again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I think we will stay in contact. Um, we may have some ideas of other seminars, like more technical. If you are, if you have the time to speak again with us, with we have another another modeling seminar, which is like uh, the the concrete technical uh, things we are working on. So I will I will uh, send you an email. <laughs> it will be interesting. Sounds good. So thank, thank you. you very much again, thank and you. have a good day. You too. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>